my point is we weren't allowed to tell our story because they didn't want. We've never been asked to tell our story. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. the consistency. That, that is consistent, hmm. yeah, until now. These two thorns in the side of the monarchy piercing once more, this time in a much touted first chapter of the Sussex's new documentary. In the first half of the series they helped produce, they take aim directly at the press. I mean, anyone can be a role expert. The whole point of it is to try and lend legitimacy to media articles and they get paid for it. And that sort of press pack of royal correspondence is essentially just a, an extended PR arm of, of, of the royal family. It's very much their account, to counterbalance what they say is an image concocted by the palace and sustained by a small group of journalists allowed access to cover the lives of the royals and the outsiders who marry into the family. But for the couple, one thing was different. As far as a lot of the family were concerned, everything that she was being put through, they had been put through as well. So it was almost like a rite of passage. And I said, the difference here is the race element. The documentary links the media's treatment towards Meghan to the abuse and harassment she ultimately received. Black people are about 3.5% of the population. They're about 0.2% of the journalists. So people who come up with these headlines, they are doing so in a newsroom that's almost entirely white. And they get to decide whether something has crossed the line of being racist. And for Harry, the royal household were complicit. In this family, sometimes, you know, you're part of the problem rather than part of the solution. And there is a huge level of unconscious bias. The Commonwealth bears no resemblance to the empires of the past. Though he had grown up travelling to over half of the countries inside the Commonwealth, he says it didn't help him develop an understanding of unconscious racial bias. As for relations with his own family, further conflict over this documentary. As the King was visiting an Advent service in central London today, the palace said they weren't given a right to reply to the film. The production company refutes this, saying they reached out to the palace but got no reply. It's really nice to just be able to have the opportunity to let people have a bit more of a glimpse into what's happened and, and also who we are. Whilst there are no blockbuster revelations, intimate video diaries and private photos are new. So far, it's been the story of when Harry met Meghan, a critique on the oldest British brand in history, potentially in episodes to come. Well, joining me now, the royal historian, Professor Anna Whitelock, and Professor David Olusoga, the historian and documentary maker who you saw appearing in the Netflix series. Um, David, first of all, I'm interested in why you took part, because... Um, this is not a sort of a normal documentary. This is very much their, their story. They're in control of it. Did you know what they were going to say when you said what you were going to say and how it would fit together? No, I was asked to talk as somebody who's interested in British history, interested in the royal family, interested in these issues. And I make documentaries myself. If you appear as a talking head, you are uh, handing over editorial control uh, to other people. I think everybody who appears in documentaries, whether I'm a talking head or the producer, is aware of that. And, I don't I think mean, it's an unusual documentary in that sense at all. Well, it's unusual in that the, the subjects of the documentary have got editorial control of it. And, and that's increasingly common, I know, on, on, on streaming platforms, but it's not... It's, it's extremely it's, common, it's, not just the streaming platforms. It's that, not that what platform. we're used to. Um, uh, but, I mean, in terms of the, the points you make, I mean, one of the really interesting points you make uh, alongside Harry is the sort of the political setting at the beginning of their relationship and the, the culture war that was kicking off around around Brexit. Um, do, you, do you get the sense that Harry is actually blaming that whole debate for what he sees as the racism directed at Meghan? No, I don't think it's what Harry's saying. I don't think it's what I'm saying. It's, of course, what people on social media and people on the far right in this country are going to pretend because that fits with their agenda. It's a very simple observation. In 2016, with Brexit, with Trump, with other things happening around the world, there has been a rise of populism. There's been a rise of emboldenment of the far right. And that was the context within, within which this mixed race relationship took place. It's a simple chronological observation that 2016 is when they, be they began their relationship. And all of these things were happening not just in Britain. It's, this is about chronology. This is not some sort of a causational um, connection that's being made, though, as I say, of course, people will make that claim because it fits their agenda. Anna Whitelock, I mean, um, 
if this isn't, you know, there wasn't sort of a, a sudden accusation that everyone can latch onto and say, well, look at what they're claiming. I mean, but what is the effect, do you think, of this series so far? Yeah, I mean, I think people who suggest that this is kind of, you know, that the palace might be quite relieved, I think are kind of missing the point, because I think the context and the, the thrust of the thesis is really that the monarchy represents and embodies a kind of racism in Britain. And, I mean, it, that is true. I mean, the royal family is a family of white inherited privilege. The monarchy, you know, is built on the profits of, of empire. I mean, these are the, the facts which perhaps people don't want to talk about, but actually Harry and Meghan, and yes, it's, you know, it's celebrity, there's pictures of, you know, Archie and the kids and all of that, but actually that all aside, there's some really quite significant uh, broader questions and challenges to the monarchy. And so I really don't think it is necessarily that the palace so far have got off relatively um, scotch-free. I think in many ways um, that's a more corrosive and much more sustained challenge, which I think is really going to be very difficult to answer because it questions really the purpose and the place of the monarchy in a progressive British society. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Do you think that that debate opens up as a result of this? Or, I mean, as we've seen, as David was saying, you know, lots of people sort of written off already and said, oh, well, look, it's just, you know, um, it's them being them. I mean, I think it should. I mean, it, I hope it does. I think it should. I mean, I think, you know, whether you're a supporter of monarchy or not, you know, we have to understand what it represents, where it's come from and what it's about. I also think, I mean, I commend your package because I think you did pick out the key things and it's not the kind of when Harry met Meghan stuff. It's actually, for example, what Harry was saying about the royal press pack. I mean, I've been saying for a long time that the media's reporting of the monarchy is stuck in the 1950s, this kind of deferential lack of critique, lack of partiality. I mean, it's bizarre, really. Um, or sorry, lack of impartiality. It's entirely partial and reverential. So I think in that and the idea that, you know, the media is a kind of PR arm of the royal family, that too is true. And that needs to also be considered as part of a wider debate. So actually, for all the kind of froth and the celebrity of it, I do think there's some quite important issues already in these first three episodes. Yeah, I mean, um, Harry says that the royal correspondents are effectively a sort of part of the PR arm of... Of, of the palace. Um, David Onsoga, I mean, to what extent do you, do you sense from having seen it um, that, that, that Prince Harry has gone on a journey? Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a clip from another contributor who sort of says, he's really changed, he's learnt. What, what, what impression do you get from that? Well, I think there's enormous truth in that. I just want to take issue with one other thing. I think this, there is a revelation, there is something new and unexpected in this, which is we get to hear the voice of a black woman who's been persecuted uh, to an extent that is horrific in this country. Hearing the voice of a black woman talking about her experiences is revelatory, I'm afraid. So that I think that idea, there's nothing new in this. Hearing Meghan is new. Uh, in terms of Harry changing, I mean, I tend to believe people don't change, and Harry's an enormous challenge to that sort of innate belief that I have. This is somebody who has looked at his life, looked at his privilege, examined it, been on a journey, as, as you say, um, and learned and thought about himself. And it's very difficult to do that. All of us don't like this uh, that level of uh, self-analysis and self-critique. I think what he has done and what he's become in the journey is remarkable. How do you think it might change the royal family's relationship with the Commonwealth and the way it's perceived in Britain, in, you know, in terms of modern Britain and race? I don't think this documentary will make a big change. I would have thought if... I would have hoped and did hope that Meghan would be the engine of change. I have some hope that King Charles, some of the utterances he's made before he became king and since, um, they tend to hint that he does understand the need for change. He does understand the need for uh, acceptance and acknowledgement of, of British history. So I'm I'm quite hopeful um, from what I've heard from our new king so far that um, change is afoot. Have, have you seen the, the the final three episodes that the rest of us haven't yet? I have. No, you haven't. You haven't yet. Okay. Well, we'll we'll see what happens uh, in uh, in there and whether there are, there is more revelation. Uh, Professor David Olasoga and Professor Anna Whitelock. Thank you both.